اوکے بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم ٹو دی تھرٹینتھ لیکچر آن منی مائی پریویس لیکچر آن منی آئی گیو جسٹ بفور لیونگ فار ہیج اینڈ آئی واز تھنکنگ آف اینڈنگ دا کلاس ایٹ دیٹ پوائنٹ سو ایکچولی آئی لک دیٹ لیکچر اینڈ آئی سا دیٹ اٹس ریئلی extremely complicated i was trying to cover the material given in four or five books in just one lecture and most people didn't have the understanding and so the lecture was almost impossible to follow and i could see that because of the confusion in the questions that followed so i'm going to basically do that again but i'm going to cover only a very small portion of the material and i'm going to try to explain it much more clearly this time especially because this topic of money is extremely important so with that uh, preliminary let me go to the uh, screen show um, the slides okay so uh these slides are available through uh, bit.ly/ss for slide share and bom for basics of money so uh, capital ss and lower case bom so these are uh, i just put them up right now so you can uh, there are lots of links in these slides so you can get them i hope everybody can see the slides is the share working properly Asuzma, can you confirm that these slides are visible? Hello, uh, can somebody respond to me? Yusuf? Yes, sir. Okay, so the slides are visible. All right, so... we start with the um, preliminary on sharia actually the lecture is mostly about the economic theory and we need to know economics before we can uh, discuss the sharia ruling but last time most of the discussion after the lecture was about the sharia status so i'm just going to make a few preliminary remarks and uh, my recommendation is that put the sharia to one side first learn the economics and then you will be able to understand the sharia ruling much better uh, this is a standard principle that you cannot give a ruling about something without knowing what that thing is and once we understand the economics of money then the sharia ruling becomes much clearer and uh, at the moment at the present time a lot of people who give rulings on uh, money have no knowledge of the nature of money so in any case i have just wanted to give a few indicative ideas so uh, umar radhiyallahu anhu was planning to use camel skin to make dirhams but uh, he was advised that if we do this then there will become a shortage of cal- camels so he did not do this so it's clear that nobody had objection to the idea of token money but it was the practical consequences and imam malik also says that if leather is being used as money in some place by social consensus then he would uh, apply the rules of money to leather the sharia rules of money to leather so there is very old and established positions on the permissibility of token money i will give some more later but i want to discuss a slightly deeper issue uh, lots of people jump in to talk about sharia rulings without knowing basics of usul al fiqh and so i just want to mention three ideas from usul al fiqh which are important for us here there is something which is called ibaratun nas what is directly written in the nusus nas is the quran but also ahadith uh, which are uh, 
clear in the sense that they are sahi and they are uh, available from multiple sources so there is no doubt about them so if there is something which is clear and explicit in the quran and hadith in the nas and direct then this is called ibadatun nas and you cannot if you deny this then you are outside of islam for example to say allah is one so the, to say the prophet is uh, muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the um, prophet last prophet and uh, the salat and the zakat maybe is basics anyone who rejects these is cannot be muslim but uh, then there is isharatun nas which is a hint or an indication not very clear and direct and then there is dalalatun nas which is the something you can deduce from logic by from from the direct sources so these three types of hukum are uh, very different in terms of uh what what uh, how their status in the deen so there are some hints in the quran and hadith that gold and silver are money but um, these hints which is isharatun nas uh, they can be considered as a recommendation which means that you can use it and it may be good but they can also be description of urf this is what is in place right now without a recommendation so this isharatun nas doesn't mean that we are bound to use gold and silver and uh, one can um there are differences of opinion about these things and these are a mercy for the ummah according to hadith so for example consider the prohibition of smoking cigarettes so there are some people who believe that this is haram and some people who believe that no this is permissible makruh but there is obviously no direct and explicit and specific hukum regarding cigarettes in the quran so this can only be derived by logic so it's not not direct so if somebody says that no i don't agree that cigarettes is haram we cannot consider him as out of islam so uh, this is this is a something which somebody uses some logic and other people can use other logic so a basic principle which has been held throughout the ages in islam is that we must be firm on the usul the fundamentals these are things which we cannot relax and we can die for them so if somebody rejects la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah this is uh, worth dying for you cannot uh, allow a rejection of the kalama to be within the islam but when it comes to furu smoking or not and token money or uh, you should be relaxed uh, there is room for difference of opinion and difference is a mercy for the ummah so this is this is some basic principle that we need to keep in mind for understanding the sharia and its role in our lives so we should be tolerant and permissive when it comes to the secondary rulings not the primary ones the primary ones we cannot be permissive but uh, we should be relaxed about the matter of whether one should lift one hand during the prayer or whether one should put it at side or whether one should have it folding these are not things worth uh, dying for so now we come to the economics so the first myth that uh, we learn about money in the books is that money came because a uh, barter was in place and it was too difficult because there was had to be double coincidence of wants if i want something and you want what i have to give then we can barter otherwise we cannot and money prevents this uh this is not true this story is not true historically people have studied now how money emerged and there is a historical account by david graeber called debt the first 5000 years and it explains how money emerged but this is a very complicated story which i will not go into but the point here is not to discredit the story 
but to understand why this story was put into place and why this is so widespread well basically from adam smith onwards uh, a school of economists has been trying to glorify the free market and to criticize the government and so the whole thrust of modern economic theory is that free markets are good governments are bad so now it turns out as we will see that money uh, governments play an essential role in money creation so um, the story actually sh- uh, is developed only to give strength to the idea that the free market can do everything so this is the controversy that starts from a long time ago that there are two theories of money one is that which comes from the free market that money uh, emerges to facilitate exchange when people are trading then it's very inconvenient to do barter so we money gets created to make uh, make it easy to uh, do market exchange but then there is also a theory that money is created by a legal framework uh, given by the state so money is a creature of the law the law tells us that money can be used for uh, transactions now it turns out that both of these things are true money is uh, very important because it makes market exchange very easy but it also requires a legal framework of some sort which we will discuss so the there is a uh, the the dominant stance among economists today is the market exchange theory of money the barter the adam smith story Uh, but this is only one part of the picture the other part is called chartalism which says that there is that money is created by the state and uh, governed by law and by social conventions and the value of money is created by taxation because taxation makes it necessary for everybody to use money and uh, sets a certain value of money so one of the critical ideas that comes from chartalism is because money is created by law it doesn't really require any backing in terms of gold or any other commodity now um we will discuss this in greater detail later one of the things that is often discussed in books and appears to have a lot of wisdom is that money is a medium of exchange and a store of value and a unit of account and a standard of deferred payment and many other things but these are actually functions of money they don't really help us to understand what money is so this is also a deceptive uh discussion of money because it's only after money is created that it can have these functions and the critical question that we need to ask is how is money created this question is not discussed and by talking about these functions you sort of bypass these questions and forget about how money got there in the first place and let's uh, talk about how it functions so this is actually hiding the central importance and significance of the first question how does money come into existence first we have given you a false story about how money came into existence and then we say okay forget about the existence even though this is uh, story is false uh, let's just concentrate on what money does so again this is a problematic so so the the central issue to focus on is how money is created how money can be created this is uh, if you understand this then you can understand about money so one of the things is that uh, this is a saying by some famous economist that anybody can create money the problem is getting people to trust it so i could st- uh, set up a printing press in my home and say this is an asad zaman dollar um i can print it like we can print uh, currency notes in monopoly for example now the question is uh, suppose i say that okay 
दिस मनी विल ट्रेड फॉर रियल वन डॉलर बिल्स हाउ कैन पीपल बी श्योर सपोज दैट आई पुट माई ओन वर्ल्ड बिहाइंड इट दैट ओके इफ एनीबडी ब्रिंग्स दिस मनी टू मी आई विल गिव हिम अ रियल डॉलर सो दिस इज अ सॉर्ट ऑफ अ बैकिंग and and uh, if people trust me then they will they can start using this money so the issue is how do we create trust in money this is critical to understanding money if trust can be created then all of the functions will of money will come into place if trust cannot be created then um money will be useless uh very uh, a lot of clarity can be achieved by thinking about the doomsday scenario suppose we are all told that the world will end tomorrow and we everybody believes this then what will happen to money now we know that money cannot be used tomorrow uh, so if somebody accepts money uh, then he is uh, assuming that somebody else later will be able to uh, we will take that money from him so it should be clear that in this situation money will fall out of use people will um stop stop uh, using money for exchange they will start bartering for whatever they need for the last day of our lives if they need anything so the point about this is that the um value of money depends on the trust that money will continue to be useful this is very important because money itself is useless so the question is how can you create this trust and so the simplest and the crudest method for doing this is to have commodity money if i'm using clothing like uh, silk was used in japan or if i'm using gold or silver or rice or oxen or camels uh then these things are intrinsically valuable so if these are being used as money then uh there is uh, no difficulty in ensuring uh, in creating trust this is automatic but if i'm using a token money i'm using a leather skin a paper note then we need additional mechanisms to create this trust and very often most often in history governments have played an important role in creating this trust in money even when you are using gold governments have played a important role by creating uh, standardized coins see if you somebody gives you a piece of gold then you have to go and measure how much uh, what is the weight of this piece and you have to determine is this uh, 24 carat or 12 carat normally people in everyday exchange cannot quantify exactly what is the quality of gold so the government mints the gold and thereby guarantees that this gold is of the right weight and the right quality and so that standardization uh, even when you have gold and silver currency is uh, uh, done by the government and that also creates is, is essential to creating trust that what you're getting is real gold and not fake if you if the gold coin has a seal of the government on it so uh, very often uh, for people who are naive like i was before i studied money uh, the question for us is that how can token money exist you have paper there is nothing behind it how can how can this be used as money this is the naive question but once you really understand how money works then the mystery becomes the opposite that commodity money that is gold and silver and bronze and many other uh, things objects uh you were used as money for a long time the question is uh for for those who understand money is how come why why wasn't token money introduced earlier and used much more widely uh so uh why is this where does this question come from it comes from understanding the harm uh, created by use of commodity money and there are two harms one is the one that is sort of obvious this is comes from the hadith we discussed earlier that if we start using 
leather camel leather uh, skin for uh, money then there will be a shortage of camels people will start using camels for money and you won't have you won't find camels to ride upon the same thing happens when you use gold uh, the use of gold for normal purposes becomes very expensive there was a time when uh, bunker hunt the hunt brothers cornered the market on silver uh, they were thinking that this will be the commodity money and uh, silver prices rose enormously and people who were using silver in different kinds of things jewelry and many other uses were unable to get silver for their use so use of a commodity for money even now you know the gold is very expensive in the world today because um there is a huge amount of uncertainty about the 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 dollar dominance has been lost many other currencies are coming to existence nobody knows what will happen next so central banks are uh collecting gold among other things because the dollar backing which is uh, which was universally in use around the world no longer seems very secure so they are trying to develop some other backing for the currency uh, but this idea that the alternative use of the commodity becomes uh, less this is not of great importance although it does it does play a role you can calculate that it causes a loss but the much more serious problem with the use of commodity is that it cannot adapt to the needs of the economy and so this is the point that i will explain in greater detail also the issue that may be puzzling is that i have said that uh, money does not require backing but i am saying that uh banks are uh, now storing gold so the question is uh, the, so the, this seems like a contradiction but the, what i want to say is that money doesn't require gold backing but money does require a mechanism for creating trust this mechanism can be gold but it can also be other things and so uh, what are these other things we will discuss later so now we come to the issue of why uh use of commodity money is bad because it does not uh meet the needs of the economy so we find that there are many many cases in history where the um money was for example gold or silver but there was not enough of it for the economy to function and as a result the economy suffered from recession and depression and many other kinds of problems now that the what the economic textbook teach is called the quantity theory of money and according to the textbooks a scarcity of money cannot happen uh, when you have a fixed amount of money uh, gold for example then um, the prices will adjust to make it enough so if you half the amount of gold that is there in the economy then the prices will become half and then everything will work just as before but this is false quantity theory doesn't hold it has never held in history and so uh, the reality is the prices do not become one half when if you if there's a contraction in the gold supply it leads to recessions depressions and many other economic problems so this is something that is important to understand because this is remains a topic of controversy among economists one of the critical contributions of keynes uh, the revolution of keynes was that he said that money matters and this is exactly what conventional economists say and today even the um, there is a real business cycle theory and according to real business cycle theory money does not matter what does that mean i mean it means that the quantity of money just determines the level of prices and has nothing else to do in the economy so if you double the quantity of money the prices will double and nothing real will change so the, uh, this is what the theory uh, currently being taught in macro around the world 
says, even though this is completely false, there's nothing to do with reality. So because this is a, a, a deadly wrong theory and uh, it is part of the deceptions about money, I will explain in, I'll try to explain in some detail why this is false and why uh, money matters and why there can be scarcity of money, even though uh, economic theory says that there is no such thing. So first, let me start with a theoretical example. Suppose that we have a simple economy, agricultural economy. We have a thousand farmers. Each one needs to spend one dirham to buy seeds and fertilizer and water and energy, the material inputs. And he has to spend one dirham on labor. Uh, and if he can uh, get all of these inputs, the capital and the labor, then he can produce one ton of wheat and he can sell this for five dirhams and so make a profit of three dirhams. So suppose that we start in an economy and every farmer has two dirhams. Then uh, 5,000 metric tons of wheat will be produced and uh, the money supply in the hands of the farmers will be 2,000 dirhams because every farmer has two dirhams. And so uh, everything will work fine. But now consider the next scenario. Suppose that farmers don't have this money, but there is money in the economy. Somebody or the other in the economy has 2,000 dirhams. Then again, the economy will function in the sense that the farmers will be able to borrow this money and produce, and they will be able to make profits of three dirhams, and they will be able to pay back their loan. Now, this is an interesting situation because um, the wealthy people, the ones who have dirhams, can charge interest, and they can charge either uh, share. So you give us half of what you produce. So if they lend two dirhams, the farmer earns five dirhams, and then in the end, uh, they split it evenly, uh, so either uh, both sides get two and a half, so the farmer gets a half a dirham of profit and they get uh, two and a half, or they split the profits, in which case they both of them make one and a half dirhams. It, uh, how this distribution is made will depend on who has how much power. If the financiers have a lot of power, then what will happen is that um, they will end up getting all the surplus. And this is what has happened uh, in history for a lo large, large period, that even though the farmer makes three units of profits, uh, basically the financiers take all the profits away and leave the farmer with just enough to feed himself and to be able to plant for the next season. So uh, because if they don't lend the money, the farmer will be able to produce zero and he will be hungry and starve. So uh, the financiers have a lot of power in these economies. But consider the third scenario where there is just not enough dirhams. Nobody has 2,000 dirhams. So in the whole economy, there are only 1,000 dirhams. Then what will happen? Only um, half of the farmers will be able to produce and 500 farmers will starve to death and there will be no production. So this is the critical scenario. If there is shortage of money, production will not take place. And uh, so uh, there is a recession. Even though the economy could have produced um, 5,000 tons, uh, the economy only produced 2,000 tons because there was only enough money to do that much. And uh, shortage of money led to a uh, severe loss. This was the critical um, contribution of Keynes. Keynes said that contrary to traditional economic theory, money matters. Money matters in the short run and money matters in the long run. If there is less than enough money, there will be a recession in the economy. Now, if you want to formalize this, and we need to formalize, one has to understand that um, this is a general principle that understanding requires theory. If you have a set of events, this is what happened. Uh, if you want to draw a lesson from it, then you have to extract a lesson which is at a higher level of abstraction so that it can apply 
in other places if you say okay farmer uh, musa uh, produced uh, this much with that much uh, labor and this much wheat this is a particular historical event if you say and, and from that you can derive nothing but if you say farmers who use fertilizer and wheat and make payments now this is an abstraction uh, this is taking this one event but making it more general then the same event might occur again and so this extracting of patterns from history this is called theory and it is essential to uh, understand so the theory we want to develop here is not part of traditional monetary theory not part of traditional economics but is essential and is developed in this book by Graziani uh, the monetary theory of production and um, basically what Graziani says is money is essential to the production process just like what I have said in the previous slide farmers borrow money and they pay for their inputs they pay wages this all this action happens first first you need money in order to buy your inputs in order to hire your labor and so money is used first and then uh, when money is used up then the production takes place and then you sell your produce uh, and then you get the money back now if you compress the time if you say everything happens all at once then the money disappears and this is why economics doesn't have any time in it and actually Keynes introduced the timing factor to, sh to show to explain why money matters is that first we use up the money then we earn the money now suppose that time is compressed everything happens in one period then the money can disappear because the money you earn is the money you pay and and basically you can take it out of the picture uh, you can say you can think of it as uh, suppose I just write a note that okay when uh, production comes takes place I will give you uh, the wheat equivalent of money then money can disappear and basically what you have is a barter economy and one important insight is that modern economic theory is purely a barter economy even though what we live in is a, is a monetary economy so that's where real business cycles and modern macro comes from they are uh, building a theory of a macro which is based on barter there are there is no real money in in the system in the modern macro so but if there is timing money must be paid first and then earned later this makes a big difference uh, for us the critical insight is that uh, in economic theories they write the production function as a function of capital and labor but we need to put in money into the production function because without money nothing will get produced and uh, um, if there is insufficient money then the output that will be produced will be less than the what uh, was possible this is called potential output in economic theory potential is what was possible to produce and actual may fall short of the potential so there is a lot of theory which can be said but as I said I'm trying to keep this lecture very simple so some of the consequences of the idea that money is necessary for production is that money must be present to allow production to take place if there is insufficient money then there will be unemployment of resources people uh, there will be farmers there will be land there will be seeds in the market but the market uh, but the farmer cannot buy those seeds there will be labor uh, but they will not get jobs because the farmer doesn't have money to hire them even though if the money was present he could hire the money and he could borrow the money and repay profitably after production but there is no money so he cannot do it so one of the critical consequences is that unemployment will take people will not be able to find jobs to feed themselves even though if they take the take those jobs and this is where the idea of helicopter money comes in suppose that somebody uh, uh, runs around with a helicopter and drops 
money on the economy. Suppose it's just tokens. He drops papers and says that this paper will be equivalent to gold. And suppose that everybody believes this, then uh, the farmer can produce wheat. He will be able to hire the people. And then uh, the uh, laborers will be able to use the money to buy wheat. And the farmer will have wheat in the end. So everybody will be happy. And the token money will disappear in the end. You can make it so that any, the money came in. There was a promise to pay gold for it. And the money just gets all used up. The laborers are paid wages. Uh, and then when the wheat is produced, they buy the wheat. And uh, the money just disappears. Uh, suppose that the farmers borrow one, uh, two dinar dirhams of token money. They pay. Then they produce wheat. And the laborers use their token money to buy the wheat. And the uh, the farmers uh, use the repayment to repay their loan. So now the money disappears. There is no money anywhere because the original loan that came in as a token money has been repaid by the same token money. It was never actually cashed. Nobody actually went to go and, um, and uh, say, okay, I have this uh, token money, give me the gold. And, and yet with this token money, production took place. So this is one very important thing to understand that this money token uh, was used and it brought a lot of benefit and it ultimately disappeared from the economy, from the accounting and everybody benefited. So um, that is one of the reasons why uh, use of token money is important. Now, so this is one part of the picture which Keynes said that if there is insufficient money, there will be unemployment. If there is too much money, then there will be inflation. This is what the Keynesian theory says. But actually, this is not true. Uh, excess money can have inflationary effects, but it can also have many other kinds of effects that we will discuss uh, somewhat later. Now, as I said, we will give many examples of why money matters in the long run and in the short run. One of the examples which you see a lot in history is that even when gold and silver were in use as standards, uh, gold and silver were too expensive to use for daily transactions. You couldn't buy eggs for it, with it and you couldn't buy small things with it. Uh, so... Uh, but markets need this money. Um, so people invented um, different kinds of token money for day-to-day -day transactions. In the USA, UK, Japan, and many other economies throughout the world, you can find periods where money is in use and it's either gold or silver or some other type of money, but it's... Um, but the units are too large for use in daily transactions. So people invented different kinds of token money. In Japan, there was a wood money in use. In UK, they had different kinds of private parties issue farthings, which were very small units of money, and they were all token. In Islamic civilization, this was called flus. Flus was small change. And it was token money and basically it used to circulate in a small area. The governor of the city would issue some tokens and they would be used by the citizens. But uh, basically, so this was token money because, again, the point that I want to make here is that the token money came into existence because of the needs of business, the needs of the economy. The economy needed small amounts of money and uh, these small change were not available in the gold and silver, so token money was created. And in Islamic uh, civilization, nobody, everybody has approved of the use of fulus as money. So, um, one of the myths that is taught in textbooks is that the government controls the supply of money. So, 
uh, what they do this story almost anyone who is an economics student should probably know this that the government creates high powered money and then there is a multiplier and uh, you take the high powered money and multiply it by the multiplier and you get the stock of the money in the economy and so according to this theory which is false uh the government can control the total money in the economy by changing the amount of high powered money they create now the truth is that in most uh financially advanced economies today the governments create only a very small amount of money less than 5% and financial institutions which were mainly banks but since the 90s there has been thing called shadow banks which are um sort of not banks but bank like institutions which also get to create money these things create 95% or more of the money and how do they create this money this is not explained in textbooks and this is very critical to understanding money so uh so again this is this myth of the money multiplier hides the role of the banks in creation of money because it says oh government is in control banks have nothing to do even in books textbook you can find that bank, uh, written explicitly i remember reading it when i was studying that banks do not create money this is literally false banks do create money and actually there was a paper written by the bank of england recently research paper in which they said that what the textbook right is false and banks actually do create money so uh this uh, modern story to understand this we have to go back to the ancient story of the creation of the bank of england now what i would like to say is that there are many 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 different ways of creating money and they have been used in history but what happens is that um once a successful method of creating money emerges and what do i mean by creating money i mean creating trust in money you have to have an institutional structure which uh, lets people trust the money that they are using and so once a particular success has been recorded then there is a bandwagon effect every say okay we have a successful way of creating money so let's just follow this instead of experimenting so there was a period actually when the bank of england was created there was an uh, a huge number of experiments going on on how to create money because there was a shortage of money and people needed money uh, for the economy but there wasn't enough money available so people were trying many different things to create money and some of these worked some of these failed uh some of these had partial success for a while and then there was failure so then the bank of england came around and it managed to successfully create money and then basically it was widely imitated so the all the other options were lost now it is uh, very possible that one of these options was a better option this is um called a bandwagon effect if you remember the in the mobiles and in the uh computers there's uh macintosh and there's windows there were many many operating systems but once uh, one of the systems became popular then all other systems were abandoned because everybody jumped on the bandwagon so that's why we need to study the history of the bank of england because this is the model which emerged and became successful and then it was globally imit- imitated so today throughout the world the pattern of trust the pattern of uh, the institutional pattern used to create trust by the bank of england is now in use throughout the world even though this is not a good model as one of the uh, governors of bank of england said the banking system we have in place today is the worst possible system and we need to find a better system 
but because um, alternatives are not around, so people uh, and and it's costly to experiment. Suppose we try a different structure, and it doesn't work. This will cause an enormous um, enormous economic catastrophe. Like in India, they tried this experiment of cashless economy, and it didn't, it didn't work. It collapsed. It caused lots of hardship to millions, but mostly because the hardship was on the poor, so it didn't matter. But anyway, they they still finished that experiment. So now uh, to go back to the history of Bank of England, uh, we understand that. Um, what uh, if you historically kings needed money, lots of it for wars, but they could not. Uh, they could raise only a small amount by taxation, and it was difficult to force people to give up money. First of all, people didn't have much money. Uh, technically, kings could borrow money from goldsmiths or others, wealthy parties, but there was a problem with this because kings were all powerful. So if they borrow money. Uh, they didn't have to pay back because they could say, oh, oh this is the law, now it's mine. So, um, in general, kings could not collect money directly from the people. So, what they would do is tax the aristocracy. So, uh, the, the, the other wealthy people. So, there was, there was an aristocracy, the wealthy people, which were few in the economy. And king would be chosen again among them. And because the king would have a lot of power, so he would take his enemies and just uh, possess their land. So ultimately, um, the parliament was created to restrict the powers of the king. And uh, one of the critical things that happened in this process was that the king was the power of taxation was and creation of money was taken away from the king and given to the parliament. So the king had to submit a budget to the parliament that this is what I want to do, and this is the money I need. So please approve uh, my raising this money from taxation. So if the parliament approved, then the king would get the money. But if the parliament didn't approve, then the king would not get the money. So uh, in 1690, there was a battle in which the French uh, Navy crushingly defeated Britain. King William was in power. and in order to protect the england he needed to he needed a lot of money he, to build a navy so basically he calculated that he wanted 1.2 million pounds and he was willing to pay 8% per, per interest but nobody was willing to give him this loan the money was available in the private sector but nobody wanted to give him because they didn't know whether he would be able to pay back and even if he was able to pay back Maybe he didn't, he wouldn't pay back and use power. And so um, the financiers came to him with a scheme. They said that we will give you the 1.2 million you want, but you have to give us the power to issue money. So the king had no choice and he did uh, because he needed that money. So he said, okay, we will create the Bank of England and the financiers will get the power to create money in England in the name of the king. So this would be official money, but created by the private source. And also, he promised to pay the 8% uh, in gold via taxation. So, uh, but uh, the Bank of England said that we will also collect this money on your behalf. So they, they also got the authority to collect taxes on behalf of the king. So they could get, they, they would ensure that they can get 96,000 pounds. They could raise it by taxes and they could create new taxes to acquire this money. So this is uh, the king. Uh, so how this happened, this is, this is of importance to understand. The king issued the Bank of England an IOU. He says, I will pay you. He, he gave them a note. Think of it as a piece of paper in which he wrote, the King of England promises to pay 1.2 million pounds of gold in five years' time. So this is a debt. This is a note, a promise to pay. Now the Bank of England issues a paper note saying that this is one pound uh, of money of England. This is one pound of money of England. And this money 
is backed by the promise of the king. What is the meaning of this? That five years later, the king will pay us gold and we will give you uh, one pound of gold in return for this one pound paper note. So, technically, this uh, the, the, the king has promised us and the king's promise is good as gold. That's what they said. So, um, this is called this is called monetization of debt. The king's debt was converted into money. The Bank of England issued money of the realm, the uh, England pound notes, and these are uh, these are to be used as circulating money throughout England, and they are backed by the promise of the king. Promise of the king is indirect here because this is the promise that. 1.2 million pounds of gold will be paid, paid in five years. And actually, both the banks and the king know that the king will never pay this promise. And the bank actually uh, built this into the note. They said that if you, in five years' time, we will give you another loan of 1.2 million uh, so that you don't have to pay the original. So uh, the original will never get paid. So, but... Uh, so this is one part. So part of the, the so as I said, the issue is not the gold behind the currency. The issue is how to create the trust. So one part of the gold, uh, one part of the trust that was created by the Bank of England was that, okay, this is a paper note. It is backed by a promise of the king. So this is only halfway there, but it is important. Uh, the note had official authority. It was issued by England on behalf of the sovereign. So it had the authority of the state. But this was not enough. But the Bank of England also had another weapon to create trust. They had a lot of gold. They didn't have 1.2 million pounds, but they had half a million pounds, say. So with this, uh, what they did was that anybody who wanted to convert that paper, uh, suppose somebody came into the Bank of England and said, okay, you have given me this paper, which says this is one pound of gold, so give me the pound of gold. So, uh, actually, the Bank of England could say, look, this gold is going to come into our hands five years later when the king pays, so I can't pay you. But then that would have been very bad for the trust in the paper. So, what the Bank of England did was, it uh, anybody who wanted to cash it, they would give them the gold. So paper was freely convertible into gold and there was no problems. So when people saw that, yes, anybody can go into the Bank of England, ask for gold and they get it. And uh, people tried and they got it. And even there were attacks on the Bank of England. The other banks were jealous of this privilege and they gathered a large amount of uh, notes and then they took them all at once to see. And the Bank of England was aware that this kind of thing would go on. So they... Um, accumulated a lot of gold for this purpose, they would borrow it. And so uh, they would just um, cash every note that was presented. So this process created trust in the paper. So after people came to believe that the paper can be cashed for gold, they stopped cashing it. Because now the paper is good as gold and paper is much more convenient to carry around than gold. Gold is much more uh, vulnerable to theft and to many other, uh, is difficult to carry around. But paper is easy to carry and is difficult to, uh, is much more easy to protect. So the notes began to circulate. Once these notes began to circulate, the Bank of England had an enormous advantage. They could print a lot of money uh, without backing. Generally speaking, so if they have, uh, so one of the things they did was they took this, these notes, 1.2 million pounds, and they gave it to the king. That's what the, so this money creation is a very strange and very paradoxical thing. It's very hard to understand. The king issued an IOU and the bank issued notes backed by this IOU and they lent this money to the king at 8% interest. This is just yani, hard to understand. Yani, the, king's, uh, the, the king gives the IOU 
the bank of england creates notes worth uh, the bank of king issues an, uh, an iou of 1.2 million the bank of england issues pounds worth 1.2 million which are backed by the iou of the king and they turn around and they lend this paper to the king at 8% interest what is happening here because uh, the, it's just the it's just the king's iou which is being lent back to the king himself but there is a difference here that the sovereign notes issued by the bank of england were backed by a promise of the bank of england to convert them to gold so now this promise which was actually carried out and the notes were converted but there was not enough gold there to convert all of them but they were never required to convert all of them so basically what's happening here is that the bank of england successfully created trust in the money and this is the cr crucial thing uh, what the bank did was, was to discover a mechanism for creating public trust so what happened as a result of this money creation uh, there's there's lots of complex details and i have discussed these details in a uh, link that i gave but i'm just going to uh, try to keep things as simple as possible so the king was able to get these 1.2 million pounds as loans backed by his own promise and uh, these were usable in the market he could buy things with it he could even buy uh, on the foreign market because uh, these things were actually convertible to gold whereas his own promise would not have been convertible to gold so uh, he built up a huge navy uh this created industrialization because they had to build a uh, iron works to make the nails and other uh, material needed for the ship building uh they had to make advances in agriculture to feed the navy and um basically all of this change was very beneficial to transform the economy of england and basically this measure led the kingdom of great britain to become uh, among the most powerful countries in the world so this trick of creating money from nothing was of central importance to the power of the uk and it made the uk dominant power in the world and today in a similar way the us dollar uh, unbacked by any thing uh made us the dominant country in the world and enabled them to fight trillion dollars wa wars because they were able to just print money to finance them unlike anybody else so this token money uh, has been of great value although even though it has caused a lot of harm to the world but it has had a lot of power so as i said the creation of fiat money has been closely linked to war um king of england uh, created this token money for um, use in war against france american civil war between the south and the north uh, both parties issued token monies to cover the war expenses the confederates lost and so the money they issued uh, became of zero value because uh, the money was created as a promise to pay uh under the assumption that we will win the war and if they won the war then the money would have been honored by the government but the government was destroyed so the currency did could not be valued but the greenbacks which were issued by the north uh continue to be legally valid instruments although they have been retired so again there was no backing for these currencies but the trust that the our party will win the war and then they will be able to honor whatever debt is there so uh what the the lesson that i'm trying to draw here is that when in an emergency like war you need a lot of money you create it by trust you say that okay i i'm i need to here is a note 
and I will pay after I win the war. And so this circulates and this makes it possible for you to conduct the war. You, you have to hire soldiers and you have to do a lot of uh, buy weapons and so on. And so you do that by issuing notes. You don't have gold for this because uh, it's, just, it's an unusual and large expense. And so currency is created by uh, trust. If people think that you can win the war, then they will honor your note. If people think you can't win the war, then they will not honor your note. In the South uh, versus North, the Civil War, towards the end of the war, the Confederate note lost all value because people thought that the, uh, the South was going to lose. And so these notes were not going to have any value. So basically, money is based on trust. You can see it clearly in emergencies like war. But the same is true in, in normal times, but it is not so obvious. So now, I would like to ask about the uh, what happens if you issue uh, unbacked currency? What makes the value of it stable? So the crypto coins today show that anybody can issue money. And these are unbacked. And they are based on trust. And the trust exists. People are using crypto today. But the value of crypto fluctuates enormously because there is no link to any reality. So this is not good quality for a currency. Today we have Pakistan in economic distress because there has been a huge variation in the USD to PQR ratio. So the question arises that, okay, so we are going to use token money. How can we keep the value stable? And this amounts to basically making sure that inflation is 0%. And then again, uh, the suggestions comes up that, okay, we can keep it stable by tying it to something which is stable in value like gold. But uh, this argument is illusionary. The price of gold has been stable for long periods of time, but there are periods of time in which it was highly unstable. And this happens in war times when the demand jumps and also when new gold mines are uh, discovered. So uh, value of gold, not necessarily stable, but the more important argument against gold backing is that the gold backed currencies cannot flexibly adjust to the demands of the economy. <coughs> so uh, what we need to do is to create trust in our currency and we need to be able to create trust without uh, giving using gold backing. To do this, we need to understand inflation. Again, economists have no idea what inflation is, how it is caused. The standard theory is a myth. The standard theory was created by Friedman that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. More money, more inflation, less money, low, no inflation. So this is false. Uh, money, does, money has an indirect relationship to inflation. Inflation is caused by rising prices. Prices are markup over costs. So basically, inflation is caused by increasing costs. Um, and monetary policy has two goals. One is to keep the exchange rate stable so that the international trade prices are stable. And the other is to keep the uh, provide enough money for domestic needs. So these two goals are in conflict. If you try to keep the exchange rate stable, then you have to have less money. You can't increase money because if you increase the amount of print a lot of PKR, then the dollar rate will, uh, the value of rupee will go down. Uh, but suppose the domestic economy wants to have more PKR, then you have to either let the uh, rate slide or you have to uh, let the domestic economy uh, suffer. So historically, the gold standard was used to keep the international trade rate stable. But also this caused a lot of suffering in the domestic economy. But this was not a problem for England because the aristocracy didn't suffer, the working classes suffered. And so they didn't mind the aristocracy keeping the gold standard. The gold standard was favorable to the elites, the powerful and the wealthy and harmful to the working classes. And it stayed in place for a long time because nobody cared about the working classes thought. 
So uh, this is again a very complicated story, and I have given a couple of articles um, about it. But basically, the gold standard stayed in place, but it was destroyed by the world wars because the gold stocks were depleted. Uh, so in the Second World War, the Bretton Woods Agreement created the USD standard, and then the Vietnam War uh, caused so much uh, spending of dollars by the USA that the USA was forced to go off the dollar backing for the gold. So then we have the floating currencies. So the critical thing to understand here, from the point of view of the Sharia, is that if you want to give a ruling about money, money has changed. four or five different times in the 20th century the nature of money it was gold back then between the wars there was a, a chaos period then after the war there was us dollar based currency and then uh, nixon shock in 71 led to floating currencies and then you had deregulation in the reagan thatcher era which uh, led to the rise of shadow banks and other kinds of money came into existence so without understanding this you cannot give a sharia ruling on money so um i'm taking uh, more time than i had planned but uh, we are nearing the end so basically we need to prevent inflation and this is a complicated process that it requires many steps but the first step is to avoid imported inflation if the cost of uh, energy goes up and you as as in pakistan are importing energy then you will have inflation this has nothing to do with monetary policy so uh the only way to avoid this inflation is to become self sufficient in energy and in food basically in essentials you should not rely on imports if you rely on imports then you will always be vulnerable to the threat of imported inflation and nothing you can do with monetary policy will prevent inflation so this is again contrary to the friedman rule that inflation is a purely monetary phenomena inflation depends on cost if you have essential imports and they become expensive you will have inflation so um modern monetary theory offers a way we can avoid we can have 0% inflation and uh, for that we need a sovereign currency uh government must never take must never borrow in foreign currencies so what happens if you have need imports and um, you don't have enough dollar exports again the government should not borrow in dollars what is a when you borrow in dollars you are promising to pay dollars in the future how will you generate these dollars you will generate them by export earnings in the future so whatever you plan to export tie that use that as payment say that i will i will give you whatever i earned from a certain block of exports so it's possible to convert uh, dollar loans to uh, promises to pay in domestic currency or in domestic resources only in this way can you have complete control of monetary policy there are other steps we can take there is a article in uh, modern monetary theory which says that the natural rate of interest is zero and basically modern monetary theory is um, islamic in the sense that it argues for zero interest zero inflation and zero unemployment and it explains how you can do it uh we need to control the value of money the value of money is determined by wages uh i'm going to go uh skip these because we are uh basically um one of the problems that is not recognized by modern economics but is very important in islam is that you have to differentiate between needs and wants so commodities which fulfill our needs are important and these should be part of the gnp but commodities which are luxuries these should not be counted as gnp and basically um uh, capitalism sets up a system where people are encouraged to expand their needs and to make their wants into needs because capitalism produces a lot of surplus and to sell that surplus it has to make people desire that surplus 
so capitalism is a very consumerist system where everyone is turned into a consumer because without that the um system would not work you would not be able to produce massive amounts of surplus and if you produce it no one would buy it so we need to correct the measures of gnp to take care of only the basic needs so one of the critical aspects of the modern monetary theory is the job guarantee everyone can be given a job and the main insight here is that uh, we can create the state can create money if it has a sovereign currency and if it creates money it can use it for socially beneficial purposes and one of these beneficial purposes is to give a productive job to everyone who wants one and this will not be inflationary because you will produce money but you will also produce uh, goods by uh, by use of that labor and so the money will be offset by the goods so basically money is free to produce if you if it is token money and so we should produce large amounts of it create as much social welfare as possible but this has not been done historically in instead the privilege of creating money has been captured by a very small financial elite and it has been used to create concentration of power and wealth in a very small number of hands and this elite has recognized the central importance of the power knowledge connection and they have created the textbooks and prevented the truth about money from reaching the public so today economists as a whole believe a lot of myths about money so how can we create money to use for public welfare instead of for the private use by financial institutions uh, there is a debate in the west about what we need to do and that's basically to take away the power of money creation from private banks and give it to the government but this is not a good solution because governments throughout the world are also corrupt and uh, government lack the information needed to serve the public interest so there is a solution i have given <clears throat> which is based on three partners based on communities and islamic banks and governments and this requires islamic banks to be instead of being a profit make, making commercial bank like the western banks it should be in the business of producing money for the benefit uh, and service of the community <coughs> and i have summarized how this would work in a new vision for islamic banks much more is possible using money creation i have uh, sketched the elements of an islamic monetary policy here which would uh, be use community based money creation for projects of social value and i uh, given some suggestions some specific ideas which can be used and uh, a small and easily implementable idea is a skill loan where you banks provide money to create skills in people which would enable them to get jobs but a much more radical and revolutionary idea is uh, islamic bank could give a life loan to a person any child who is born gets enough money for 20 years to enable uh, that person to become a productive member of society and then when when he or she starts earning money they can repay the loan this is like your 30 year mortgages in the usa where you take a huge chunk of money at one time and then you pay it over the lifetime uh, uh, for 30 years so like that a large loan can be given uh, to sustain all you know you pay for schooling and health and uh, clothing and housing and uh, education until the um, person whom you have given the life loan to becomes a productive member of society and then you can get repayment so all of these are ideas which can be implemented if we put the if we think about seriously about money creation for public welfare instead of money creation for welfare of the financiers okay so that is the end of this lecture and i am going to uh, open the floor for uh discussion and questions i have taken a little bit longer than usual uh, so all right so that's the end of my lecture and now we are open for 
questions. I hope that Henry, yes. Can you um, unmute or and ask? Yes. Yes, Henry. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum as salam, Henry. So, alhamdulillah, how is Hajj? How is Makkah? How is Medina? <laughs> alhamdulillah, Henry is an old student of mine. Uh, we have very <laughs> little time, so let's uh, focus on questions related to the lecture. Yes, sir. Ibn Khaldun says in uh, in his book Muqaddimah yeah. that rich country, rich country is not the country has huge money, but rich country has uh, is a country that huge productive uh, uh, sources, domestic yes. productive sources. That so, is correct. So from your lecture, I just remind to my mind that what Ibn Khaldun says for 500 years ago come to the reality in my mind. Thank you, sir. Yes. That is correct. That is correct. That You see, this money is a myth. The government needs money to development. No. Uh, we need real resources. Money is an artificial resource. You can produce as much of it as you want. So the real resources, do you have land? Do you have people? Do you have uh, material resources? So if you have all of those, if you have trees, you have soil, you have seeds, you have people who have the skills, then what's the problem? Why, why are you saying that we don't have money to hire people? You don't need money. You print the money you need. And that's, that's really the, one of the central messages of MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Any other questions? All right, if there are no more questions, we have used up almost 90 minutes, so we can stop. Uh, did it, uh, is there any message in the chat? Oh, I see the chat has been. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for such a nice uh, lecture. Uh, it uh, really uh, answered a lot of questions. Um, I recently attended a talk, and um, um, and I asked a question that uh, Islamic banks uh, do create money like the conventional banks. So the speaker said that yeah, they uh, if there is a bank, they will definitely create money um, uh, into the economy. And um, there was an option available that banks could uh, work as an asset management. Uh, do you think that if banks uh, follow the asset management model, they would not create money into the economy and it will be beneficial for real economy to connect with financial system? Um Banks, yeah, the job, the, the job of banks in modern economy is to create money. So no bank can avoid doing that. Uh, as far as asset management is concerned, this is just a way of making more money. And this is the standard profit orientation of banks. And what I'm saying is that in order to create genuine Islamic banks, the motivation should not be to make profits. It should be to provide service to the community. So... How that can be done requires thinking in a very different way. And so asset man management is definitely not the way to go. So let me ask Fatma Sumro. Yes. Fatma, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Hello? Yes. Alaikum. Wa alaikum as Sir, what about the importance of crypto money in today's economy? Uh, crypto is useless. It's not important and it is uh, not a good model. As I said, it doesn't have tie to anything real. And so its value is very erratic and variable. And we have seen that. So one needs uh, that. That is not helpful for us. And I've discussed this in detail in a number of other lectures. Thank you. All right, Hamid. 
حامد شريف sorry uh, i muted you by accident unmute yourself again again yes okay can you hear me now yes i can hear you thank you i say assalamu alaikum first and thank you for a very insightful lecture i have a quick question that uh, during the covid would you agree that the way that uh, the major powers have printed money a lot of it ostensibly to address the social crisis to what extent can we find evidence for some of the ideas you have suggested in your lecture that uh, you know printing money <coughs> can in fact be used for social for social goods yes i think that uh, there is a lot of evidence that a lot of different uh, governments nearly all over the world uh, printed money token money without any backing and that was very helpful for the public interest because the economies would have collapsed without it and especially in pakistan we did a especially good job in terms of supporting people who were uh, put into crisis by the uh, by the covid so yes uh, money can be created for public service and uh, oh anas zarqa thank you for your comment time happy to hear this uh there is a comment by puts gundert about uh, mmt conference in the um chat so i'm just going to repeat that i don't know what's happening in the chat i'm just repeating the comment so this is for mmt there is a lot of um, overlap between ideas of modern monetary theory and islamic ideas and actually i'm working with some experts in mmt to on on the general topic of mmt meets islam if there is any hope of creating a zero interest economy today it requires a theoretical framework and this theoretical framework is now available via mmt so this is uh, definitely something very worth studying for muslims so shahid sultan asked this chat question the definition of bay in sharia calls for real counter value on both sides so real payment is inevitable why don't we simply go for commodity or commodity backed money so i think you did not listen to my lecture uh, please go over it once again because the whole lecture was an answer to this question so anything else any other questions all right so i think we will um quit here i don't see any other questions all right so um subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun wa salamun lil mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin